Welcome to Tech Throwback. Did you know that old GPS navigation and mapping were two totally separate things? Well, actually even today, they still are two totally separate things. GPS is actually very simple, even though we take it for granted and use it every day. Like mapping and GPS are a single entity. The reality is that those maps, they come from the internet and the GPS signal, that comes from the satellites. So GPS satellites are honestly pretty simple. They transmit two streams of data and one of those is basically a radio transmission saying, this is when I sent it. And then this GPS receiver or any GPS receiver listens to a bunch of different satellites sending that data and it knows the time that those signals left the satellite and once they hit it, it just calculates its position based on the difference between those times. With three satellites, you can know where you're at on Earth. And with four satellites, you can know where you're at and how high you are on Earth. So that's the difference between 2D and 3D navigation on this Magellan GPS 2000. Now it's called the GPS 2000. You might think this came out in the year 2000, but it definitely did not. This came out in 1995. And you can tell it has no onboard mapping at all. Really all it does is plot your location. It can tell you where you're at on Earth and it can tell you where you've been if you were tracking it on this GPS the entire time. So let's talk about the Magellan GPS 2000. This thing is pretty small. In fact, it looks like it could fit in a shirt pocket. It also has this gigantic necklace, I guess, so you can hang it around your neck and not lose it, even though it seems like it's, it's way too long. Where it would land on your body doesn't seem like a good time, especially if you're a guy. Anyway, it weighs quite a bit. It's basically a brick because there are four double A's in the bottom of this thing. You didn't have to power it with four double A's. There was an external adapter and we'll go ahead and pop the batteries out since we're here and talking about that adapter. It's a little bit of work. You kind of have to push, wiggle. This is sealed with an O-ring. Once you get the cover off, you can see the batteries and you could actually take all of these out and there was a big plastic brick you could put in here that would let you power it externally because there are no ports on it for external power. So that was a $50 accessory back in the day. You could blow through a lot of AA batteries for the price of that adapter. We'll put this back in here. I'm not quite sure what the GPS 2000 cost, but its successor, the GPS 2000 XL, was $210. And back in the day, these things didn't have massive swings in prices for the most part, so you could probably take $20, $30 off, assume that this was about a $180 device, maybe it was $200, but it wouldn't have cost much less than the GPS 2000 XL. There are a ton of these things on eBay, and it looks like a lot of people are also Googling these, trying to figure out how to make them work. And unfortunately, I hate to be the one that breaks it to you, but none of these are ever gonna work again. It's not waterproof, but it's probably splash proof based on that O-ring and this keypad being sealed. The display looks like it's sealed pretty well too. So a quick overview of the rest of it. On the back here, we've got a uh, GPS 2000 label, a part number 62010. It was assembled in Mexico. Inside it is the AllView 12 GPS receiver. And that is an antique. Nothing like the Serif Star 3s and you know, the assisted GPS receivers we're used to today that get a lock-in. I mean, if we don't have a lock-in two seconds, you're probably mad. This, if you move it more than 300 miles or take the batteries out, can take 15 minutes to get a lock. Now you can cheat that by giving it an approximate position so it kind of knows where it's at, and you put in the latitude and longitude, which is crazy. You have to know where the city you're in is at. You put the latitude and longitude in, and then it will acquire a lock within about four minutes. So it can be better. And if the GPS unit already had a lock recently, a warm startup, it only takes about 15 seconds. So if you're using it consistently, it's not bad at all. So if you pull it out of a drawer and go camping, just plan on waiting 15 minutes for it to start up if you don't do an initialization process. Right here on the front, we've got GPS 2000 in gold. The antenna's up here at the top. It's that big old angled section of the case. We've got an on off button. We'll go ahead and fire it up. We have the gold Magellan right here. You actually have to hold that button for a second. GPS 2000 copyright Magellan Corp 1995 on startup. And I do have some initialization data in there, but this is completely dead. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Unfortunately, this GPS will never work again and there's nothing you can do to fix it. So here's a quick walkthrough of the keypad on the 2000. We've got the on off button that we just used to fire this thing up and it's trying to start up right now. Beside that, we have the light button, which is a green LED backlight, and it didn't turn on. You really have to push the buttons on this thing. It's got a nice glow to it. Uh, that, that old LED glow 
that we were used to before color screens and nice backlights. And it honestly worked pretty well in most conditions. We've got the nav button, which will load us into different nav screens. You can push it over and over and over and it just rolls through the screens, kind of like a Rolodex, just flipping over and over. And here's that main navigation Rolodex in action. So it starts on the position page, showing our latitude and longitude and searching, of course, because we don't have a GPS lock. We'll hit it again and we get pointer. Pointer is very cool. We've got bearing and distance over here. So it'll show our bearing in degrees down here at the bottom and our distance to destination underneath that one. So the pointer shows whatever waypoint you have programmed in the GPS and it's just a, a swinging pointer like that. And basically you turn and walk until it shows that you're going in the right way. You probably put it like straight down the middle and keep walking in that direction until you get to your destination. And then we have navigation, the next page. We've got bearing, distance to destination, our current heading and our speed. I mean, these were the days when we still expected all of our car speedometers to be off by three mile an hour. So having this kind of accuracy in your car, really, really cool. In the final page, we've got the plotter. That's our chart plotter showing where we've been and where we're going. And it can also show, you know, you can flip the plotter. It can show your um, off course. It's got a course deviation indicator. So it can show how far off course you are and which direction you need to travel on the CDI so you can pick your course back up and get to where you need to go. And navigation again gets us back to the position page. We've got go to. The go to button opens your list of waypoints you have saved in the unit. So you can save them, name them whatever you want and recall them with the press of a button so you can navigate to different places around like a campsite or a park or you know the parking lot at the park because you definitely wanna get back there to where your car is. So I've got one saved in there right now. It's called one, two, three. Underneath that, we've got the menu button, which loads all your options for the device and lets you see your satellite status and reset the device, everything like that. Date and time is displayed right there at the top too. And then of course we have the clear button, which should let us clear a route. Unfortunately, we don't have any satellite lock, so we don't have anything to clear. In the middle of the keypad, we've got a four-way D-pad there with an enter button to confirm anything you need uh, if you're navigating through menus or something like that. So we'll hit satellite status. And strangely, it looks like we actually have six satellites, but there's no way it's connected to any of these. Um, as it gets a better lock on the satellites right now, they just show an asterisk, but they change to a number for signal strength. And right now we have no numbers on the board. We'll flip through some of the other menus here. We've got our route menu. You can create a route, you can backtrack, which is pretty cool. It'll just reverse where you're at and give you a heading so you can get back to where you started. We've got clear for your route, reverse and view. Let's go down to landmark list here. And it looks like I do have one landmark in there and then I also have the position we're at currently, which you can save as a landmark whenever you want. Again, there were no maps on these old GPS devices. It's literally latitude and longitude navigation. You could pull out your own map and compare it, but for the most part, all these do is plot a course of where you've been and where you wanna go. That's it. So that is the landmark setup. You can save a lot of them. And then we have the L fix list, which apparently if you go into it, it says no fixes saved. Well, fine. And then we have the setup menu as well. We've got initialization, which is where you would put in the closest city. And I do have some data in there. And unfortunately, like I said, it's never gonna lock onto a satellite again. We'll get to that in just a moment. We've got the coordinate system, elevation mode. You can switch between 3D and 2D. Obviously we want it in 3D, but without four satellites, we're stuck in 2D, and without any satellites, we're stuck in 0D. There are no dimensions here. We've got datums. You can set up the uh, datums for the part of the world or the map system that you want, if I remember right. Yeah, you can switch to a whole bunch of them. Right now, I think it's on World Geode. There's North American 27, a whole bunch of different datum setups. Speed units, you can switch between knots, mile per hour, and kilometer per hour. That's actually really nice. If you're out on a boat, you might want it in knots. In an airplane, knots. On the ground in America, mile per hour. Everywhere else in the world, probably kilometers. So let's get out of there. I'm leaving it in miles per hour. You got the time display. You can switch between 24 hour time, 12 hour time, and universal coordinated time. It just says UT because this thing is old. This GPS is so old, they still differentiated between PPS for the military and SPS for civilians, which was precise positioning system and standard positioning system. GPS would transmit a calculated error for civilian GPSs that were using SPS, so they wouldn't be as accurate as the military. Now, that turned out to be, you know, they decided it was a safety issue for the whole world, and eventually that was rolled back and now all GPSs, honestly, very, very accurate. Thankfully now we don't have to consider if our GPS is accurate or not. It usually tells us right where we're at on the street, down to, I mean, inches. 
Anyway, the very last option in setup is clear memory. And if you hit that, you can hit clear again and wipe the whole device. We're not gonna do that. So I'm gonna show you the GPS 2000 trying to acquire a satellite signal outside right now. I spent probably three hours, uh, well, I was doing other things out in the yard, but I left this out trying to get a satellite fix without initializing it, with initializing it, with setting the time, and without setting the time. And unfortunately, it is dead in the water. In fact, this probably stopped working either after 1999 or after 2019. GPS transmits its date as a block of years, and really old GPS units like this one can't accept the current blocks that the GPS system is transmitting. So it's called the weak rollover problem. This one has a run into it. If you ever take the batteries out of them for an extended period and it loses its date and time, it will never work again. So the majority of these that are for sale, if you buy one, are not going to work, including this one. It will actually show me that it's getting a satellite fix. You can see the bar coming up and the bar gets closer and closer and closer to the end. There's three sections on the bar graph. And if you get to the third one, it should be ready to lock on. And when that bar disappears, it'll show the time and date precisely from the GPS satellite. And that means it's ready to navigate. Unfortunately, this one sits there on either the second bar and one time even the third bar, but it never moved on to the date and time because it doesn't know what's going on with the satellite positions versus the time and date that it thinks it has. And you can't actually set the date in the unit to 2023 either. I think the latest date I could set it to was 2003. So I would assume this GPS unit was worthless after 2019. Now there are some old GPS units from Garmin. You can actually hook onto them with uh, serial and program the date again, and then they'll work again. Unfortunately, this one has no external data capabilities, so there's no way to ever fix this. Crazy, it works, but it will never work again. So that is the very cool Magellan GPS 2000. I had fun trying to make it work. Unfortunately, uh, I've, I don't think we're ever gonna get there without tearing this thing apart and probing the chips, maybe rewriting them with custom firmware or something like that. It's definitely gone forever. It's too bad that it works and doesn't work at the same time. That's definitely a heartbreaking moment for these old electronics. So that is all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for watching Tech Throwback. Don't forget to subscribe, and I can't wait to see you on the next one.